tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A employee uh, had been allegedly assaulted by a customer who refused to wear a face mask. Oh. Hey, 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 stop, please. Mask melee at Walmart. A man is arrested after a fight with an employee. Also, 13 more deaths and a record day for new COVID-19 cases in BC. And uh, seeing these lines, I'm not sure if everyone's local though. It's a bit suspicious. With day trippers being told to stay away, Whistler Blackcomb opens for the season. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us tonight. Another dispute over BC's mandatory mask policy has turned violent and the disturbing incident was caught on camera. And tensions boiled over inside a Walmart store when an employee was attacked for telling a customer to put on a mask. As our John Hernandez reports, police have arrested a 30-year-old Dawson Creek man for assault and mischief. It started at the greeting door, an employee urging a customer to wear a mask, a request that ended in violence. Dawson Creek police say a confrontation erupted between a customer and an employee inside a Walmart, all over masks. The worker ended up on the floor. That's when witnesses started filming. The man on top, raining punches and kicks. Those watching, pleading with him to stop. Then the man appears to smash the worker's phone. The police were called. The police do have an investigation going on right now, which involves an alleged assault, among other offenses. RCMP say they arrested the man at his home Wednesday night. Assault and mischief charges are pending. Community leaders already speaking out against the attack. The worker was disabled. He's worked there a long time and, you know, he's, uh, he's a disabled individual. He's, he's, um, he's a young fellow that just goes to work every day and, and you see him there and he says hello and he's just going there to work. And um, it was just so disheartening to see that happen. This incident, among several that have happened in B.C. since masks were made mandatory. Earlier this week, a hotel coffee shop employee was spit on by a customer who refused to wear a mask. The worker suffered a heart attack and is now in hospital. The mounting tensions prompting stern words from B.C.'s top doctor. And I have no time for people who believe that wearing a mask somehow makes them ill or is a, a sign of lack of freedom. To me, it's about respect for our fellow um, people who are suffering through this with us. With cases mounting in B.C., so too have anxieties and fears on both sides of the mask debate. Psychologist Michael Woodworth says the tensions can make people more prone to confrontations. And as something like that escalates, you have more of a chance that it's going to turn sideways in a way where it might even get aggressive. And so everyone's kind of, you know, right out of the gates, more prone to something going uh, sideways. And Health officials are urging everyone to respect the rules and fines are in place for those who don't. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, as we mentioned, B.C. is staring at another one-day record of new COVID-19 cases and deaths. Dan Burra joins us now live with more on today's numbers. So, Dan, uh, more sadness tonight for families across the province. Yes, for the second day in a row, more than a dozen people have died from COVID-19 here. And our daily count is another grim high. For a second straight day, 13 people have died from the disease. We've now lost 384 people in our province. We have 887 new cases today, the majority in Fraser Health. Same as yesterday, 294 people are in hospital, though a few more are now in ICU. We have almost 7,900 active cases province-wide, and just over 10,300 people are under public health monitoring. A week has now passed since Dr. Bonnie Henry put in orders telling people to wear masks in most indoor spaces unless they can't for medical reasons. And while many were already doing so, we've seen numerous cases of people not wearing a mask, berating store staff, getting abuses, getting abusive, and as we saw in John's piece, getting violent when asked to put one on. You can be fined up to $230 if you refuse to wear one or are belligerent when asked to do so. As we hear, Dr. Henry doesn't have much time for people who think that wearing a mask impinges their freedom. The Premier agrees. Belligerent people should, be, uh, should w grow up. 
and, and those that have legitimate reasons they're not able to wear a mask, we'll be working through those issues with Dr. Henry and others to confirm what legitimate reasons to not put a mask on are, and we'll deal with that in the days ahead. But as we wait for those guidelines, 26 families have lost loved ones in the last two days here in our province. Mike, Tanya. Thanks so much, Dan. Our Dan Burt reporting live tonight. Well, after many months of planning, Whistler Blackcomb has opened this year's ski season, but with a twist, now with pandemic protocols front and center. But for perhaps the first time in its history, the community is hoping tourists and day trippers will stay away in line with the province's non-essential travel advisory. Our Tina Lovegreen now has more from the mountain. You're welcome, I'm great day. On opening day, excitement fills the air. Awesome out there today. <laughs> Snowing, it's cold, <laughs> vibes good. A fresh dusting of snow and plenty of eager folks waiting to hit the slopes. Overall, amazing day. While the lines may look long, it's only because of physical distancing measures. It wasn't nearly as crowded as other years and well below the 25,000 skiers that the mountain sees on its busiest of days. Out of towners are discouraged from visiting. Recommendations from the provincial health officer in an effort to curb the sharp rise in COVID-19 cases. I've seen these lines, I'm not sure if everyone's local though. It's a bit suspicious. Some admitting they're from the lower mainland. Uh, just North Vancouver. We come from Vancouver, <laughs> yeah. Vail Resorts, which owns and operates Whistler Blackcomb, isn't keeping track of where people are coming from, but focusing on ensuring a safe visit. When you come to ride a lift here, you can only ride with your cohort, your family. Masks are mandatory, reservations are a must, and payments, well, they're all cashless. Our goal is to get open and to stay open. And so if we can do that, we'll consider the season a success. There's a lot riding here. Whistler lives and breathes tourism, and businesses here are hoping that the provincial health officer's recommendation to stay away is a temporary one. Opening day was as quiet as we expected. But she says that's okay. It gives them a chance to test out their protocols and adapt if need be. We absolutely re rely on the tourist market. Um, our local patrons have been great to us in the slow season. And I think there's a lot, uh, a lot of people are waiting for the guests to arrive, but we want to get this right. Slow and steady, much better than a complete wipeout. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Whistler. Well, shoppers at Coquitlam Centre may have noticed the Hudson's Bay has reopened after the courts sided with the retailer. Last weekend, the mall property management firm Morgard Investments locked the bay's doors and terminated the lease for failure to pay rent. Well, now a decision handed down from B.C. Supreme Court ruled it can reopen. But the bay is still on the hook for 50 percent of the rent. The company is struggling to pay its bills in other parts of the country amid the pandemic and plans to close its flagship Winnipeg store. Well, coming up a little later in the show, we'll be answering, answering your COVID-19 questions once again with BC's Deputy Provincial Health Officer. Dr. Reka Gustafson will join us at 6.30 to take live questions from you, our viewers. Feel free to email us at cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca or phone us at 604-662-6801. And just a reminder, when calling in, please keep your questions short so that we can answer as many as possible. Uh, you can also leave a question on our Facebook and YouTube live streams if you're watching online tonight. Surrey RCMP have arrested a man who allegedly threatened violence against Surrey Councillor Jack Hundile and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on social media. A 42-year-old Surrey man was taken into custody Wednesday, then released with restrictions to ensure Hundile's safety. Police are recommending two charges of uttering threats. The suspect is not known to police. He is set to appear in court in the new year. An East Vancouver teen is speaking out about how long she's been waiting for surgery to correct her scoliosis. Over the course of a year, she's barely budged on the wait list with dozens of people still in front of her. As CBC's Rafferty Baker reports, her family is concerned that her condition is getting worse while she waits. This is the big curve and that's around 70 degrees. 
14-year-old Jane Childerhose was diagnosed with scoliosis about two years ago. The spine is curved to such a point that, you know, it puts pressure on her lungs and her heart. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just, at this point, we're worried that the longer we wait for surgery, the less effective the surgery will be. It's uh, really pushing at some of my other bones in my body, like it makes my rib cage pop out my back. And it also like kind of makes some of my shoulder blades weird. But yeah, it's not very good and it's, it needs to be corrected with surgery. About 20 months ago, Childerhose got on a wait list for spinal surgery at BC Children's Hospital. There's a national benchmark for surgeries like this, 180 days. She's already waited much longer than that, along with many young people across the country. We were told that Jane's number was number 35 on the wait list a year ago, and in a year she's moved three spots. The surgery won't be fun. It's very involved and will leave Childerhose with a metal rod in her back for life. And they insert uh, a metal rod in her back and then sort of fasten her vertebra as best they can to that rod to straighten the spine. But Childerhose says waiting is even worse and she's living with endless pain. I think back pain is one of like the worst pains in my opinion. Um, and it's just really annoying to have it so constant. A spokesperson with BC Children's Hospital says the first wave of the pandemic affected surgeries at the hospital and spinal surgery wait times are increasing across the country. She said in a statement, we recognize these delays impact the lives of young people waiting for this surgery. Strategies to reduce the wait for these surgeries include expanding operating room capacity and increasing the number of hours these surgeries are performed each week. Our family doesn't want, you know, in any way special treatment. We don't want to uh, skip the line, but, uh, you know, we don't mind waiting in line as long as we know the line is going to move more than a year later and I still haven't gotten this fixed and it's kind of like what are we gonna do now you know Childerhose says she doesn't feel there's anything she can do but deal with her misbehaving spine and wait Rafferty Baker CBC News Vancouver Vancouver City Council has voted to ask the federal government for the power to decriminalize simple possession of illegal drugs to try to stem the tide of overdose deaths I also think that this council is really leading uh, the country uh, and if not the continent in terms of, of addressing this, this horrible plague that we have, uh, which, which is causing so much trauma. Mayor Stewart has said the federal health minister is a champion of decriminalization and can quickly approve the plan. He says a decision, though, may not be made until the spring. Well, four B.C. men face gambling charges after a raid uncovered an alleged poker ring at a Burnaby cafe. The province's anti-gang unit seized poker tables, slot machines, poker chips and playing cards from Big Shots Cafe in July. Two Burnaby residents, a Delta man and another from New Westminster, all aged between 36 and 58, are now charged with being in a common gaming or betting house. The men are scheduled to appear in court tomorrow and again in early January. Joe Hanna Wagstaff joins us now. You nailed the forecast once again, darn you. <laughs> you said that the showers would arrive today and they did, pretty much when you said they would. Thank you. Yes. Um, I mean, <laughs> sometimes I wish I wasn't. I, what, the models weren't so accurate. Uh, I'm standing in some pretty intense mist, if those two words can go together, intense and mist. But that is exactly what we've got right now. Basically, it's like we're in a cloud across Metro Vancouver. Uh, we've got one more good shot of rain before we get to that weekend sunshine. Let me show you what it looks like on the radar. We're actually not dealing with a big system right now. We're waiting for the cold front, but in advance of it, we're getting some moisture, uh, some heavier downpours right now uh, out towards uh, South Surrey, uh, but things are looking generally dry as we head into the evening hours. Uh, we've got a bigger system again tracking down from the northwest. That is currently bringing uh, some weather warnings to places like the island, the Sunshine Coast. I'm going to talk more about that. We've got wind 
rain and snow to talk about as the system approaches Vancouver. Uh, the cold front will get to us tomorrow afternoon and at that point we're looking at a good downpour as the front tracks through as well as gusty winds across Metro Vancouver. Uh, the cold front will dramatically clear things out behind us. There's the center of low just pushing that moisture into uh, central coastal sections. Uh, again, good dramatic clear out for the weekend. So I'll time that all out and uh, talk more about those warnings coming up and I'll get out of the mist. Okay, get out of the mist. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you in a bit. Well, let's talk provincial politics now and the BC NDP has unveiled its new cabinet after sweeping to a majority in last month's provincial election. And while some familiar ministers will continue to head the same portfolios, there are some new faces in the fold. Take a look. David Eby remains attorney general and is now also the minister in charge of housing. Selena Robinson takes over from Carol James as minister of finance. Not surprisingly, Adrian Dix will continue on as health minister. Rob Fleming has been moved out of education and now into transportation. Replacing him as education minister is first-time MLA Jennifer Whiteside. Mike Farnworth is still solicitor general and public safety minister. And returning MLA Ravi Kalon now becomes minister of jobs and economic recovery. That's a new file. Sheila Malcolmson gets a post as well for the first time. Now minister of mental health and addictions. Former MP Murray Rankin becomes Indigenous Relations Minister. And finally, Mitzi Dean is now taking on the Ministry of Children and Family Development. We have 57 MLAs. Uh, we've got those with significant experience. We have those who have just arrived, happy to be here. Uh, I looked at the, the holes in the cabinet as a result of re retirements. I looked at the people who wanted a, uh, to take on a fresh start. I wanted to make sure that people were excited about coming to work every day. Uh, and I think we've managed to get, find that balance. And with his government now sworn in, the legislature will reconvene for a pre-holiday sitting starting December 7th. One of the first orders of business will be delivering on the NDP's campaign promise of $1,000 for families. It's still unclear if it'll be distributed before Christmas. And just a quick reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. Well, CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Still ahead tonight, the Trudeau government is under fire for not yet planning a rapid vaccine dispersal plan. Why some provinces are saying the feds have bungled the plan next. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Of all the curveballs we faced so far in 2020, this one might be the warmest and the fuzziest but it's no less unsettling. Yeah, parts of the country have seen an explosion in their rodent populations. Saskatchewan, for example, is dealing with a major mouse infestation. But as Fiona Odlum reports, it's not all bad news. Good afternoon, Poolins. The phones at Poolins Pest Control in Regina are ringing off the hook, mm -hmm. and people are looking to get rid of one unwelcome guest. 2020 along with all of the other things that have happened, has been easily the busiest mouse year we have seen in probably 20 years. Sherwood says not only are the numbers up for house calls, but also with insurance claims. We clean trailers and cars that have had mice in them. Normally, we will see them starting in March or April, and we'll be done by July. We're doing one tomorrow. And this isn't just a Regina problem. It's generally all across the southern half of the province, and I believe our Saskatoon office is seeing the same thing up north. Up in Saskatoon, the mouse population is also booming, and all these mice mean the local wildlife are being fed very well. The, the one of the ways that we know that there's a bounty of mice is that the, the birds in the spring have a large brood. When, when they're struggling to feed themselves, they're not going to have a whole bunch of babies that they know that they can't feed. Shattuck says research shows bird numbers went up this year, but so were the number of birds injured in traps. We went from sort of um, one sticky trap last year to seven this year. So it's a huge increase. Um, we had um, four snap-trapped birds last year and seven this year. 
And of course, it breaks their leg. We had one that came in and it had actually caught on the beak of the bird and just broken it. When it comes to getting rid of mice, Shattuck prefers snap traps for two reasons. Because when they work, they're incredibly effective and quick and humane. If you live in the country on a farm and you are the only person for several miles and you can swear up and down and around that you don't use poison and you use snap traps for your mice, you can donate them. But when it comes to explaining why there are so many mice this year, Shadok can sure would agree this boom is abnormal. They say a spike like this usually only happens when there's been a lot of snow the winter before, which didn't happen in Saskatchewan. Sherwood has a simple explanation. People ask me, why are we seeing so many mice? It's 2020, man. What do you expect? Fiona Odlum, CBC News, Regina. So I hate to admit this, or maybe not, but mice and rodents are my biggest phobia. Spiders, snakes, anything else is fine, but that's just terrifying. All right, well, stay away from those parts. Yes. Yeah. Okay, back in just a second, more COVID-19 news from across the country. We were looking forward to seeing you at our open house, but things are different this year. Last year, we raised more than a million dollars for local food banks across BC. We're not going to let 2020 stop us. It's great to see you. Especially at a time when the food banks need support the most. I'm so glad you asked. Join us online and on Radio 1 for CBC British Columbia's Food Bank Day on December 4th. The federal government has now finalized purchase agreements with five COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers. And today, the deputy chief public health officer said some Canadians could be getting vaccinated in just a few months. But as David Cochran reports, there are still some hurdles to clear. There's no greater question in Canada right now than when can I get my vaccine? So experts tried to give an answer. We expect certain vaccines to become available in early 2021. However, it's important to note that the initial supply of these vaccines will be limited. Early in 2021 likely means January. Limited means about 6 million doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines by the end of March. We're looking at, uh, at, a, at a population of about 3 million Canadians uh, um, being uh, sort of at the, at the beginning uh, to be vaccinated. But even that modest start depends on regulatory approval. The U.S. and Europe are on track for December. Canada says it won't be far behind. We're expecting to make a final decision on the vaccines around the same time as both the U.S. FDA and uh, the European Med Medicines Agency. And so the government is scrambling to get the freezers, syringes and swabs it will take to start a national vaccination program in the middle of a Canadian winter. While the drug companies push for final approval and try to scale manufacturing to meet an insatiable demand. There's a lot to do and a lot can go wrong. And for people that are, are saying specific dates, I think that's great that they've got the confidence in those numbers. But from what we're seeing, there really are a lot of moving parts. The overall plan is to use those initial doses for high-risk populations and frontline essential workers. Deliveries will ramp up over the spring and the summer and as other vaccines get approved for use. If it all works, the majority of Canadians could be vaccinated by next fall. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. One province over now, Alberta continues to struggle with surging COVID case numbers as well. And now audio obtained by CBC News suggests division between Alberta's premier and his chief public health officer. Our Jenny Russell has the CBC exclusive. Based on recommendations from the chief medical officer of health. A familiar phrase from Alberta Premier Jason Kenney on Tuesday when he issued new restrictions, he said based on advice from the province's top doctor. But CBC News has obtained secret recordings from Alberta's COVID-19 Emergency Operations Centre. They reveal Kenny and his cabinet sometimes overruled the advice of Chief Medical Officer Dr. Dina Hinshaw. And they suggest politicians pushed a relaunch strategy more focused on not curtailing Albertans' freedoms than safeguarding public health. 
For example, on June 9th, hours before Kenny announced the second stage of Alberta's economic relaunch, Hinshaw relayed the political direction she was getting. Essentially, I think what we're hearing, we just want to test with the minister's office because I don't want us to enforce anything. We want us to educate and no enforcement. Confidential sources tell CBC News Kenny has set thresholds to introduce new restrictions that are effectively impossible to meet. His top priority, sources say, is the economy. The leader of the opposition. Opposition NDP leader Rachel Notley says Kenny is micromanaging the pandemic response for his political base and not the broader public. Kenny's judgment should not be used to replace uh, the, the science-based recommendations in the, in the majority of cases of our chief medical officer of health. She called on Kenny to establish an independent scientific panel to advise the government and make its recommendations public. In the legislature, Kenny made no apologies. I plead guilty. I have sought evidence and data to inform our challenging public health decisions and ensure that they are uh, taken in a balanced way. Well, some tense moments again outside a Toronto area barbecue restaurant that has been the focus of anti-lockdown protests this week. Supporters of its owner screaming at police as officers moved in to make an arrest and make sure the restaurant stays closed. CBC's Greg Ross takes us through what happened. Police were at Adamson Barbecue just after 6 o'clock this morning to change the locks on the doors to the restaurant. At 6 o'clock this morning, uh, with the assistance of the city, the locks were changed at the premises and all persons were restricted from access to the premises. Owner Adam Skelly arrived just before 8 o'clock to find the parking lot blocked by police. After a brief conversation, police allowed Skelly to access the parking lot. Moments later, he punches a passcode into the back door and is able to gain access to the building. He's seen bringing food through the back door, presumably food he intends to sell. They're in the process of uh, him entering. Uh, they broke through the drywall and entered the uh, restaurant proper. I am Throughout the morning, Skelly's supporters begin to arrive, gathering outside the restaurant. Inside, Skelly is seen trying to open the doors that have been locked by police, at one point even putting out a call for a locksmith on social media. Just before 12.30, with Skelly still attempting to open, mounted police arrive. They storm the restaurant to disperse the crowd, while other uniformed officers arrest Skelly, as well as another man who tried to intervene. He faces one count of attempt to obstruct police, one count of mischief under. He also faces a count of failing to comply with a uh, continued order under the Reopening of Ontario Act. Police boarding up the windows to Adamson Barbecue tonight. They're also changing all of the locks throughout the entire building. As for Adam Skelly, he remains in police custody where he will remain overnight. He has a bail hearing tomorrow morning. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Well, BC's provincial a deputy provincial health officer, Dr. Reka Gustafson, is standing by to take your COVID questions. Email us at cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca or give us a call 604-662-6801. And a reminder when calling in, please keep your questions concise so we can answer as many as possible. You can also leave a question on our Facebook or YouTube live streams if you're watching online. Stay with us. Day four of the B.C. government employees strike and there's still no sign of a settlement. Negotiations are continuing tonight with the help of a provincial mediator, but neither side is reporting any progress. The southern B.C. interior has been cut off from the coast by the strike and by snow. Jerry Thompson reports. The first significant storm of winter hit B.C.'s coastal mountains overnight, dumping a lot of wet snow on the main highway between Hope and Princeton. With highway crews on the picket line and no one to run the snow plows, motorists got stuck and eventually the RCMP had to close the road. Another serious problem, this time for dairy farmers who live on Barnston Island in the Fraser River east of Vancouver. The only ferry service is shut down by the strike, so the farmers could not get their milk off the island to a dairy plant. This morning, their holding tanks were nearly full, hardly enough room left for the afternoon milking, and since cows don't stop giving milk just because there's a strike, 
the farmers figured they'd have to dump 8,000 liters of milk on the ground. This stuff is getting too old that we have now to contain much longer, and we'll just have to let it go and, and uh, start with, a, with a, an empty tank again and hope by then that uh, things would be under control. But farmers are a stubborn bunch who don't give up easily. They borrowed a fish boat, a small barge, and put a portable tank on a pickup truck in a last-ditch effort to haul the milk around the picket lines themselves. And all the things that could go wrong did. So at sunset, the farmers finally did get their milk off the island, and for the time being, their problem is solved. But there are other situations like this around the province, and it's a safe bet that a lot of people are not happy about the way the strike is affecting them. Jerry Thompson, CBC News, on the Fraser River. It's the annual event that people gladly line up for. Inside, the crowds wander to and fro, buying, tasting, or just looking. It's the annual Hadassah Bazaar. More than 1,400 Hadassah women have been working a year to turn three P&E buildings into a two-day bargain department store. It's going great. We've got a tremendous crowd. This is our first year that we've opened up on Sunday, and it's proving to be fantastic. And so hopefully we'll continue to open up on Sundays. The bazaar is the biggest of its kind in Western Canada, with nearly 100,000 square feet of exhibits. There's a saying that if Hadassah hasn't got it, it doesn't exist. The revenue from the bazaar goes to charity, and with 30,000 people expected to attend the event, this year's take should be better than ever. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. You know, it's just so concerning to think that we're in this kind of a place where uh, people take that kind of a, uh, action over uh, somebody trying to do their job. Another violent situation spinning off the province's mask mandate. Tensions boiling over inside a northern B.C. Walmart last night. Witnesses captured video of a worker being attacked for telling a customer to wear a mask. Police have arrested a Dawson Creek man for assault and mischief. You know, I look around, I still see a ton of excitement here from our locals today. And, uh, you know, our goal is to get open and to stay open. Well, the message is locals only, but is it being taken to heart? Whistler Blackcomb opens today, marking the unofficial start of ski season pandemic style. The province, though, has issued a travel advisory urging people to stick to their own communities. However, with few ways to monitor or enforce, there's plenty of skepticism that the directive is not being followed. And B.C. continues to break COVID-19 records, again setting a new daily high number of cases. 887 in the past 24 hours, along with 13 more deaths since the most yet in one day. Its hospitalizations have hit another peak as well. 294 currently in hospital, 64 of those patients in intensive care. And with those rising numbers come more concerns about how B.C. is handling its fight against COVID-19. Joining us now live to answer your questions is our province's Deputy Provincial Health Officer, Dr. Rekha Gustafson. Dr. Gustafson, thanks so much for doing this again. We've got lots of questions coming in, so we'll get right to them. I know you saw the beginning of our newscast with that uh, violent confrontation over masks at the... Uh, the Walmart. Here's a question from Sharon asking, I am and others are perplexed at those who feel that wearing a mask is an infringement on their freedoms. Do you have any advice on what we should say to those people if we encounter them? I think the most important thing about the mask directive is that most people wear it most of the time. I wouldn't confront an individual. Um, as we've just seen the negative uh, consequences. We don't always know people's um, uh, people's uh, um, uh, situation or why they're not wearing a mask. I think the important thing about the about the mask directive is that everyone who can wear a mask, one does wear a mask in public spaces. I think one of the things that I've noticed in the pandemic over the last little while is focusing on the exceptions. And what we just saw was really, really distressing. 
Um, but what I also see that most people are trying to do their very best. Dr. Gustafson, I want to touch on um, the theme about inconsistency, and that seems to be an overarching complaint for many, perhaps. A Twitter user asks, why are the rules inconsistent? Everyone needs to wear masks in public spaces, but schools aren't a, quote, public space. Or indoor workout classes are not allowed, yet big gyms, uh, they reference Golds and Orange Theory, etc., are still open, and, and hockey rec leagues are allowed to go ahead. So can you help maybe walk us through some of those uh, seeming con seemingly contradicting uh, rules? I think the, the long list of rules are, in fact, um, can be quite confusing. But I think uh, what I can tell you is that um, that they, they are based on two things. One, the intent of the of the rules or the intent of the orders is to limit the activities where we know transmission has occurred. We know that restrictions on people's lives have consequences. So we are doing our very best to make sure that only those activities are limited or are reduced or have additional uh, safety requirements where transmission has occurred. What we know is that many sectors of our society are functioning quite safely with uh, appropriate safety measures in place. Schools is one of those places. Restaurants is one of those places. We, know, we have had some transmission in group uh, activities, group exercise classes, but in gyms where, where people are uh, working out on their own or with one other person, again, with appropriate safety measures, uh, transmissions has transmissions or have not been uh, particularly common. So those are important things that we take into consideration when we think through what are the things that we want to pay special attention to. And so often people um, ask why, why here and why not there? And really at the end of the day, the numbers tell us what we need to focus on. Well, let's uh, talk about those numbers some more. There's been uh, a considerable debate and discussion about how uh, BC releases the numbers and what kind of data it's releasing or not releasing. Uh, Lynn would like to know, how can we get more specific information about where community exposures are happening, uh, perhaps beyond the Health Authority websites? So the, so the, the question is, um, I'm just trying to understand the question a little bit. So we are trying to give general information on what are the places where, where transmissions are likely to occur. We tend to post transmissions where there is a unique um, transmission that a person may or may not know about and we want them to behave potentially differently because that exposure has occurred. But the reality is, is that the vast majority of times uh, COVID-19 is acquired either at a home, a social gathering in the home or, um, or uh, just from people who live with you in your home or in your workplace. And those are not situations where public uh, exposure notifications are required because as part of contact tracing, we can actually contact the individuals, the individuals who are at, at additional risk. So the public exposures uh, may be uh, required or used in situations where we don't have the ability to reach the individuals directly. Let's go back to something that came up at the beginning of the pandemic, and this is COVID and food packaging. Uh, Maureen on Facebook asks, have there been any suspected, suspected cases of COVID transmission through food or food packaging? I know we did hear early on, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry talked about that, um, but wondering with the, how the research has evolved and we know more about it now, is continuing to wash everything, is that useful or wasteful, they wanna know? So that's a really good question. As we are learning more and more, about uh, COVID-19, we know that the vast majority of transmission is occurring through close face-to-face -face contact with somebody who has COVID-19. There can be a, uh, or in very crowded places with others. At this moment, it does appear that with, with the number of cases we have that what we call um, transmission through surfaces may be less important. Having said that, we don't know that transmission doesn't occur that way, and therefore uh, using basic environmental cleaning as a, a way to uh, reduce the transmission of pathogens is not a bad idea, but we know that the most important things are really to avoid crowding and stay home when you're sick and, um, and keep a, a reasonable distance from others. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go to uh, this one from Rich uh, from uh, groceries to swimming pools. Uh, are there any cases from swimming pools? Rich is asking, uh, is swimming safe if all measures are obeyed? So swimming is an individual sport um, and, and therefore we certainly don't think that there's any additional or excess risk 
associated with swimming. Swimming pools are open. They have safety protocols. I go to them. Um, and uh, we, cert we have not had any clusters associated with those kind of um, individuals indoor sports. Again, one of the things that the, the three C's, the crowding, the I can't remember what the other C's are, but um, indoor spaces through crowding uh, and close uh, contact with others, and especially with a large number of others, are the things that we're trying to avoid. So swimming pools, um, again, are safe and, and exercise is really, really good for you. I know you get uh, asked about your office but probably more than anything else, schools possible transmission in schools. We have Christy on Twitter who wants to know if infected children often have mild or no symptoms but need more uh, to be showing them for a test, how can you be certain there isn't more transmission in schools? And how can you be sure that most of the cases with unknown links are simply not missed school cases? Well, that's a really good, really good question. So one of the things is that we, well, that that um, we, we are able to monitor the number of cases in children who, um, who are five to se who are school age, five to 17 uh, years of age. And we, again, most of the time, we know where people are acquiring their infection. They're acquiring it in their homes, through community settings, through their social networks. And whenever we, we follow up every case in a school, every uh, uh, classroom knows if there was a case of COVID-19 in their school. And if there's a second case, then there's an even uh, further um, and more deep uh, uh, investigation. So in any setting, in truly in any setting in the world, there's uh, likely to be somewhat more uh, transmission than we completely detect. But the patterns of, of nearly 60 million cases around the world are telling us where transmission is actually occurring. And the goal of COVID-19 control is not to detect every last case, is to reduce transmission, especially in the areas where most transmission is occurring. And what has emerged from around the world, even when there was either prospective follow-up of cases or the follow-up of cases that we are doing uh, here in British Columbia is that schools are not a driver of transmission. They're not a driver of transmission in the community. Uh, reopening schools does not uh, um, uh, drive further transmission. Closing of schools does not stop transmission. So uh, we know that as a driver of transmission in the middle of a pandemic, where the goal of control is not zero cases, schools are not a, a dominant or important source of uh, transmission. What we know is that, that kids who are acquiring COVID-19 are acquiring it most likely in social settings or in their homes. And in fact, structures acti structured activities uh, such as schools are actually safer than, um, than uh, gathering with others in your community. Okay, time for a couple of uh, uh, questions. Let's get to these quickly. Kulpreet asking, uh, we're saying accessible public health can improve health outcomes and save lives in this pandemic, and health authorities haven't been able to cope. So why is multilingual interpretation missing from the COVID-19 updates. Why is it so difficult to uh, not hire a few professional interpreters? Well, first of all, um, music to my ears whenever somebody says that public health is important. Um, it absolutely is. And actually, I'll just take that feedback and um, thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll do what we can to make sure that multilingual uh, translation for important materials becomes more widely available. It's a good point. I want to talk about uh, just briefly here long-term care homes. Uh, a Twitter user wants to know why are health officials rejecting rapid tests as a measure to limit uh, transmission by staff into these facilities? So I, I wouldn't say that they're rejecting it, but what I do know is that my colleagues who are managing outbreaks in long-term care facilities have a really, really strong, good understanding of what drives transmission and what prevents it. So one of the things that I'm finding in this pandemic, and I think perhaps um, uh, you know, the amount of information and the amount of conversation that we have about communicable disease control and epidemiology and testing um, does drive a lot of ideas about what are the best ways to prevent transmission. But the things that we, but the things that I know from my long-term care facility uh, or people who are managing outbreaks in long-term care facilities is that the, the prevention and control and management of outbreaks in long-term care facilities is a very, very detailed process and people have identified the things that make a difference. And one of the things that makes a difference is symptom checks for staff, certainly broad testing if there's, there's, um, there's a case. Um, and it's really, um, really driven by what makes a difference. And there has been a lot of call for broad testing or asymptomatic testing. And really there have been 
no, no settings where that has been proven to be an effective way to control the pandemic. We know that we want to do testing in situations where people are actually exposed and have symptoms or if they have certain symptoms, but this notion that broadly testing populations who are not feeling ill is a um, is a, an effective way of controlling the pandemic simply hasn't borne out so far. Okay, a final question uh, to Laura on Facebook who wants to know if the current orders, directives, guidelines, mandates don't drive down our caseloads in BC, what's next? So that's a, that's a really good question. So I think what's important is that, um, that the, throughout the entire world uh, where there is winter right now or late fall right now, there's a surge. So we now know that COVID-19 is more easily or it does appear more easily transmitted in the winter months. So we're experiencing, experiencing a surge like everybody else. It is also important to remember what the goal of, um, of COVID-19 control is. And the goal of COVID-19 control and, and these orders is not to get to zero. And we may not even actually in the winter achieve a decline in cases. What we want to make sure is that there isn't an ongoing increase in cases that increases hospitalizations, that increases um, that increases ICU admissions and, and really overwhelms that very precious resource in our province. So I, I'm glad somebody asked that because I think people assume um, often that, that what we can achieve through these orders is um, driving cases down. And we can't necessarily do that. Um, we can't necessarily do that. We can't necessarily do that, but what we can do is we can, we can prevent ongoing growth to allow us as a society and a healthcare system to manage and respond and maintain our health services. It sounds like that was the bat signal to let you go. So doctor, once again, as always, thank you so much for joining us. That's BC's Deputy Provincial Health Officer, Dr. Reka Gustafson, taking your questions live tonight. Thanks. Coming up, if you find yourself doing a lot of your holiday shopping online this year, you're not alone. And that has Canada Post struggling to deliver how it's planning to tackle the December rush after the break. Quarter to seven on this misty Thursday evening. The showers arrived on the south coast as Johanna told us they would, but she's got good news for the weekend. Her forecast is next.
The Market Report is brought to you by Fortis BC. We've got even bigger rebates. Rebates. Whoa. On select high-efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time. Our meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is now uh, with another back now with another look at the forecast. And Johanna, uh, you know we have survived a rather soggy stretch. I guess that's what we've signed up for living on the coast uh, in November. But yeah. it's, it's been nice to come up for air a few times. Uh, it sounds like oh. more to come too, though. Yeah, we need those uh, breaks to come up for air. Literally, as you said, it has been a soggy week. And yes, it's the end of our wettest month. It is November. It is Vancouver, but. Yeah, it was a bit of a wet one. I feel like we've been watching that Saturday forecast literally since Monday. Uh, let me show you the warnings. First of all, across the province, this is with the cold front that will bring us our last shot of rain tomorrow. Right now, bringing some severe weather. First of all, heavy rain for the west coast of the island, 100 millimeters by tomorrow morning, and then another 20 to 30 tomorrow. Strong winds for the east side of the island and the Sunshine Coast. Uh, more rain up towards inland sections. And then snow, uh, the Tilcoton all the way through Prince George and into the Rockies, 10 to 15 plus centimeters over the next 24 hours. This is what it'll ha this is what will happen when the front gets down to us. So taking you through Friday morning, it's really just chance of showers and drizzle. The heavy rain doesn't move in, I don't think, until after 4 p.m. That's when the front looks to sweep through. Look how quickly that moves out, though, behind it. Clearing skies for Saturday. Our cold fronts, when we do get them, are dramatic, and we will see a nice uh, dry out for a Saturday. Bigger picture, here's that front pushing inland and you can see the top end, the warm front, bringing some good snow to an already impressive snow base uh, for many of the resorts across the region. A little low pressure system moving into northern BC for tomorrow night, but high pressure is certainly the story for most of us for Saturday. Notice that next big system will bring some more rain to the northwest for Sunday. Uh, seeing some sunshine in Kamloops, Kelowna and Cranbrook tomorrow. Uh, you've got a nice weekend forecast as well. So there, there she be. Nine for Saturday, seven for Sunday. Uh, mix the sun and cloud on Saturday, increasing cloud for Sunday. So we'll start off with the sun by the end of the day, overcast. We should stay dry though through till Monday. And in case we already need something to look forward to, in case we're already thinking about next Monday before we even get to the weekend, I don't blame anyone. Next weekend, sunny and dry. Oh. What a nice thing to hear you say. Thank you <laughs> yes. so much, Johanna. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, Canada Post says Canadians have been online shopping like it's Christmas ever since the pandemic began back in March. Now, as Stu Mills reports, with the holiday season actually here, both parcel delivery companies and retailers are bracing for a surge in buying and shipping. This is probably something you don't imagine when you click on that add to cart button. But with more and more people avoiding Main Street and shopping from home, this has been a typical scene since the pandemic began. These dollies look a bit like Santa's sleigh, except most of these boxes have come not from the North Pole, but from Amazon.com. Canadians, you know, in March and April started shopping online. You could see them, their comfort level grow throughout the year. Spokesperson John Hamilton says Canada Post has had a front row seat to the explosion in online shopping. He says with the pandemic, Canadians began buying online at the rate the company was projecting for three years from now. It's been an absolute leapfrog. To handle the Christmas surge, Canada Post is hiring 4,000 extra staff and putting 1,000 more vehicles on the road to handle the holiday surge. Likewise, Amazon Canada is hiring 10,000 seasonal employees. Well, we are definitely seeing um, a rise in demand. Jen Hayward of Ottawa courier company Go For It Delivery says the pandemic gave her fledgling courier business a shot in the arm. Go For It rented extra warehouse space. Now they stock and immediately ship the goods of small and medium sized businesses across Ottawa. We're seven times um, bigger than we were a year ago. One of Go For It's delivery customers is Batter Up Bakery in Westboro. Online buyers clicked up Jamie Lynn Pacheca's custom cakes and cookies and go for it delivers them. The summer definitely took off for children who had to cancel their birthday parties. So you got to cancel the birthday party, but you got a really cool cake in instead. 
Online retailers and the courier companies who serve them say the shopping habits developed over COVID are probably here to stay. Stu Mills, CBC News, Ottawa. Still ahead tonight, it is a very, very deep pool, and it's not for those who aren't afraid of getting in over their head. How deep can you go? Find out after the break. This is what the grandstand at Leamington Raceway used to look like on race day. A thousand people in the stands. This is what it looked like for the last 10 race dates this past summer. The first three days, COVID restrictions allowed no one in the stands. The Lakeshore Horse Racing Association was only able to offer online betting. Online wagering continued for the remaining 10 dates with 100 people allowed in the stands. The combination resulted in a successful year. Some bets were even coming in from as far away as Nova Scotia. The president is hoping that as long as COVID-19 isn't a factor next summer, they should be able to have their best season ever when the stands can once again be full. This year we did do all the simulcast wagering and we got out to a, a vast market. So maybe uh, next year, hand in hand, we'll bet yet again higher than ever. Harness Horse Racing employs about 2,000 people directly and indirectly in Essex County, 10,000 in southwestern Ontario. Drop Top Hanover has uh, found a home here. Horseman Don Leeshide is a member of the association and employs three people. He says the economic impact of harness racing in Ontario is immense. For example, in 2016, the horse racing and breeding industry in Ontario is credited with contributing about $2 billion in economic activity to the province of Ontario. Leeshide gets his figures from the body that oversees horse racing, Ontario Racing. He says local figures aren't available. Harness racing accounts for a small percentage of sales at this feed warehouse in Essex. But well, we do sell, you know, uh, the feed, the animal health products. So it's not near as much as we used to. But 18-year-old Waverly Livingston, who works as a stable hand for Leeshide, says she would lose her job if horse racing went away. I would have a very hard time finding another job. And there are only so many other farms on the, in the area that take people. The Horse Racing Association has applied to Ontario Racing Management to add two more race dates next season, but Williams is not confident they will be granted. He says they should find out soon. Dale Molnar, CBC News, Lakeshore. Welcome back. Well, there are deep sea divers and then there are deep, deep sea divers. Now, those in the latter camp can perfect their skills indoors at what is for now the deepest diving pool in the world. Yes, the pool in Poland known as Deep Spot is suitable, they say, for divers of all skill levels. First, you dive down 20 meters to the bottom of the main part of the pool. From there, you continue your descent through a concrete tube that ends 45 and a half meters below the surface. Tanya says that's 147 <laughs> feet. Those who prefer more shallow waters can get a glimpse through an underwater viewing tunnel located inside the pool. A 50 meter deep pool is now being constructed in the south of England. Must be 
popular. The things we have to do during pandemic times to stay busy. That just puts ice in my veins, though, for some reason. It just gives me the chills. Yeah. I can't see myself even going in the viewing <laughs> to, to check that out. Yeah, maybe not so much. All right. Just a uh, quick reminder, you can always find this newscast online, cbc.ca slash bc. And our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock tonight after the National with Dan Burt. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.